these two things are pretty key. All right, so I wanted to go through a few questions um, and you know, kind of give you examples on what kind of questions you can come up. There's plenty of other questions out there. You know, just go search for it on the web. Uh, most of our questions are public, but again, knowing the answer to a question is just gets you part of the way there. It's how well you answered why you picked the solution you picked, right? So for example, okay, let's take this question, right? It's a array of size n, and every number is between one and n. Determine how many you think about it. Right? Simple. So the first thing you want to do is ask the interviewer, or maybe even tell the interviewer, not even ask, like, here's the thing I'm going to do. Because once you ask, like say for example, if you ask the interviewer, can I destroy or modify the array? If they say no, suddenly your choices are limited, right? But if you if you come out and say, hey, I'm going to approach this problem by modifying the array, is that you know you don't have to say that's okay. You just just state as a statement. That's going to give you an easy way out. If the interviewer is you know really looking for a way not to do it, then he'll say or she will say, no, I don't want you to change the array. But my suggestion is to get clarity or state how you understand the problem. Um, find the point is, right? The interviewer might tell you, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. I'll send, I'll always make sure there's something in your area that wouldn't be in here. Or it's always going to be in yours. You don't have to type check. So like all of these things, now suddenly you have eliminated corner cases, down each other, things that where you're focusing on solving the problem now. Right? So, best way to solve that. Yeah. Alright, so, here's, a, here's, here's a, one of the solutions. What do you think is wrong with the solution? One person. Complexity, right. So, this is a solution you write if you don't know any other solution. Right? This is the worst case scenario, so it is going through every single user plus the n squared is let's see. Um, you can probably make it a lot simpler. But if you're running out of time, you can't think of anything smarter, this is what you write out. You should get partial error. Alright. Let's think look at another one. Same problem, different solution. What do you think the problem is here? I mean, I think it's a reasonable solution. It's, it's definitely, you know, not as complex as the previous one. But, do you know what arrays.fill is complexity? It's a library function, it's a black box to you. And if you use that function, you better know what it does. Or at least have an idea. Right? And because that's the, like if, if you gave me this solution, my next question would have been, what's the complexity of array out there? So know the language, know the library functions, make sure you come prepared. You know, don't pick the language based on the interviewer, pick the language based on what you know. If you know Java the best, pick Java. If you know Python the best, pick Python. Uh, Facebook interviews are never um, language specific, we're language agnostic. You can code it any language you want. So if I had people come in and full code it, Erlang ones, um, that's the strangest language I've seen. And I, I've never coded in Erlang, but honestly, from a from an engineer to an engineer, if you don't even understand a language, you can at least read it. And if there's, you know, like if you don't understand a structure, you can always ask the person writing it and say, hey, what does this mean? How does this work? And that will give me a lot more signal because this person understands how to explain this to me, right? So don't worry about what language you pick, just make sure you're really good at it. And you can always sit there, you know, after you finish your problem, you can discuss what are better solutions, or if you had time, or if you had, you know, a better idea of like what other library functions you can use, what are the pitfalls of using them, things like that. So for example, this is another solution. Very similar, but what is it doing? One, it's risky because it's modifying the array. 
right? Because it's using, using stored. And you really don't know what kind of stored it is. So if I ask you the complexity, would you really know? Um, so that's you know, something to keep in mind. Maybe, maybe just go through the documentation and make sure you know, you know hey, is it a quick store, is it a you know, merge store, whatever it is. Maybe you can specify a store. Uh, and when you talk to the inter interviewer, you can say, well, if I had to write it, I would write a quick sort, and the complexity of quick sort is going to log in, and that's what it is. So my whole solution is not that complex. But, so, going back to this, you know, like, if you're stuck, take time, think out loud, see what, you know, what's, what's wrong with the problem, what's really, where you can, you know, make a solution better, where you can focus your attention. Alright, let's think, let's look at another question, right? Um, how can you find out if there's a loop in a very long list? I didn't specify what kind of list. Right? So, what would your first question be? Alright, well, I can give this loop. So, you know, this, this kind of like, this is a, probably a terrible solution for that question. Because what it's doing is, it's only checking if it's a full loop. Like, is the last pointer pointing to the first one? That's it. I never asked uh, any clarifying questions. I just wrote this up. That's probably going to be a bad idea. Right? If you want to ask clarifying questions as much as you can, ask it, you know, what the interviewer really wanted to get out of it. And what I, my question would be is a single unit list. Um, will there only be full loops or can it move anywhere? And can I modify the notes? Uh, or is it, you know, like, can I have, have a previous pointer or something? Which will make it a lot easier to choose. And they'll have different solutions. Alright, so when I, when I actually came up with, uh, when I bought all these slides from Coworker of mine, he had this solution up. And uh, immediately I saw that and I, does that really work? Um, it looks like a valid solution, but it's not really. So I have to go ahead and fix it. So here's what I changed. I changed check to current, and then it was going to store some text errors, so I returned to zero. Um, the solution is probably a pretty good one. Uh, it, it, it covers most of the edge cases. Um, you know, it starts and all that things that it doesn't, but other than that, it does cover most of the edge cases. Right. Um, and you know, I would accept this. But what I would suggest is you guys use the whiteboard to your advantage. Draw uh, what I notice a lot of interns spend to, or a lot of interviewers don't do is they don't um, write test cases. You know, like what are the corner test cases that you would normally write unit tests for? Uh, I urge you to do that. On a corner of the whiteboard, just write, like, draw all the different types of inputs that it can be, and then you can just walk through your solution and make sure you cover everything. Uh, I think that's, that's probably the most important thing you can do. Um, this is probably the most optimal solution for this. This is a, a slow, fast solution. And what it does is it sends one pointer going through the input really fast, and the other one really slow. And the second, the fast pointer laps the, the slow pointer. You have your answer. I, I, this is just a online solution, but we don't expect anyone to come up with this. This is something you don't come up with in an interview. I'm just showing you this is an example of like this person actually did research on this problem based on this issue. We expect you to come up with a previous one. Uh, we expect you to like give us all the edge cases you could, you know, figure out what works, what doesn't. Give us, you know, your complexity of the solution and things like that. Final question. The idea here is I want you to, given a number n, I want you to print um, numbers in sequential order as it spirals in, right? Uh, this is a very common question. I've asked this before, and people mess this up all the time. And the main reason for this is they don't sit down and think through it. Uh, there's many ways to write a solution for this. Um, my preferred method is to do it recursively, so you do the outside first, and 
and then you call the function again, do the inside, keep going until you finish. Um, people always mess up on the corner pieces, like if n is 1, then they don't know what to do, or if n is 2. Okay? Um, they always, uh, they come in and they kind of get stuck on how to find the order because they're trying to do one loop where it goes all the way in. Um, and you just can't. <coughs> so, this slide just kind of just goes through how to do this. It's done in four loops uh, in decreasing pattern and you just, you know, call it cursory. But the main idea here is you try to find a pattern in the solution, apply it, and go through this. Right? Just break up the solution, and now you know how to do it personally. Anyway, um, but what it comes down to is when the interviewer asks you a question, like, do you know everything you need to know to answer that question? That's what you need to ask yourself. Um, can, you, can you draw it up? Usually, if you draw up a solution, you, you will get a response back from the interviewer. You know, they'll either look happy or, you know, they'll tell you pretty much is this the right solution or not. You should use that to your advantage. It's a lot harder if you want a phone screen, but in person, make sure you take that advantage. You know, write things on the board, look at them, read their body language, get an idea of are you headed in the right direction or not. At least you can sense that either you're getting closer or farther away. So if you're going, if you're doing it wrong, it's probably not right either. Um, you know, Give different solutions. Tell the interviewer if you want me to do this recursively or descriptively, or if you, if you want to know a solution, take it and tell them this is what you're going to do. Uh, the more you can explain the solution to the interviewer, the better off it will be because they'll probably give you hints, they'll probably help you through the interview. And after that, after you put up the you know, pro, uh, solution, tell them what you think can improve the solution. Tell them where you think the solution is lacking. So all of these will help you, um, help the interviewer get a better signal of how well you understand the problem. Right? And what, I put this up here last night, but the reason I have this slide is, is because people are too hasty usually. They'll, they'll, they'll write up something really quickly, um, and they kind of, you know, like, immediately say, yes, this is my final answer, is done, so I know it works. And it's usually, you know, you want to take your time after you finish the solution to go through a double, triple check to make sure your solution works. Because a lot of interviewers, uh, interviewees fail out of our interview process because they didn't really think through the solution properly. They either gave us an unoptimized solution or they missed really basic checks. Or, you know, they have null point exceptions for no reason, things like that. Uh, infinite use. All of these things will come by you if you don't really think about the solution. And honestly, like, write a lot of code, right? You need to train for this. It's, it's, it's definitely something that you cannot just sit in a textbook, learn, memorize the algorithms, memorize your formulas and things like that, and have you and the habit apply. Um, the more experience you have, the probably the easier interview you will get. Um, I, you know, I, I recommend getting a friend and having them ask you interview questions and seeing if you can do it. Um, and it's kind of out of order, but um, when you're doing four screens, also make sure you're, you know, especially the ones on Skype, make sure you're in a quiet room, internet connection, headphones on, because a lot of times, um, it's really hard to understand the other person, especially just when you're not looking at the face, when you're just listening to the face, it's really hard to understand on both sides. And if there's a misunderstanding, it's, you know, it just hurts you more than you know, anything else. Okay. But, um, you know, during the interview, we'll ask very common questions like, hey, why did you pick Facebook? Or why did you pick uh, why, why do you decide to go into computer science? Or why did you work on this one project for your academic work? And you know, be sure you know how to answer those. Be sure you understand your project.
you up. If you're working a team um, and someone asks you specifics, Uh, so, so I actually, 
Um, so I used to work in California. I've worked at Facebook for about five and a half years now. Um, and I used to work in California. And, uh, and I recently moved to London about a year ago. And so my favorite part of my job is to actually build a London office. I get to do, this is pretty much like a startup. And uh, I am there to build a team. And that's what I like. Not from undergrad. So, like, if you wanted to do, so we usually try to recruit generalists. Um, we believe in generalists because we encourage engineers to move around in the company. So we will hire. Like, our hiring philosophy is pretty much you don't even need a degree uh, to apply. As long as you can pass that interviews, you're you're fine to work there. Um, but. Uh, so we won't hire, usually we won't hire into a specific role unless either you're doing research in that area, you're, you have a PhD or a master's or something, or you have tons of industry experience in that particular area. For example, like one area you can think of is uh, machine learning or um, compilers, uh, static analysis. Uh, we recently acquired a company that does pure static analysis, and all those guys are PhDs in that field. So we would expect them to come in and do static analysis. But usually when we hire people, we hire them as a general engineer. For example, a research consultant that particular field, would you hire them? We would probably interview as a generalist, most likely. <laughs> uh, but our interviews don't change. So like it's probably in your best interest. Like you can like the way our process works is once you get hired, uh, you start um, we started this uh, six-week program called Boot Camp, and um, you, you know, like get used to our code base, you get used to our staff, you get used to how we work, and then the last two weeks of that program, you get to choose your team. So uh, you kind of have your free choice of what team you want to end up in, and you could possibly pick data science, data sciences, or data mining, or whatever. Uh, so it's. It's very flexible. Um, we don't, you know, like, like I said, we don't really care about the language. We don't really care about uh, the degrees and things like that usually. And we, like, some of the top engineers don't even have a bachelor's degree um, at Facebook. And including Carlos, by the way. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you come in, you do the program, you get used to it, and you pick, like, let's say I'm a front end guy. I'm, I only want to do Java script, I only want to do CSS, I want to do design. That's all you want to do. You can go to a front end team. If you want to do C++, uh, obviously, like if you want to do kernel hacking or something very specific, you better have good experience in that area because we're pretty much at the cutting edge of of that field. So if you don't really know what you're doing, you're not going to be successful on that team. So as long as we think you'll be successful on that team, we'll let you work there. Just to add to that, uh, boot camp is your time when you know, we kind of decide on these things, depending upon how you've done during your training and what kind of requirement we're looking for during a, that point of time. Uh, and like the teams have their requirements in terms of how many engineers they would need, and that's when these decisions are made in terms of what team you can join, which which particular area. In the interview, does this, uh, what skills you are, like you said you are designing or C++, like does it matter? I am a very amateur guy, so my question will be amateur, I am Sophie. Can you clarify that a little more? Like you said if you want to go in design, you are good in design, C++, yeah. CSS, JavaScript, like and yeah, yeah. Um, I know there are other parts of C++, like what advantages do you have in this area? Uh, so, like, there are many advantages in C++, like, uh, there are many advantages in C++, like, uh, there are many advantages in C++, like, 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 I am a front end designer. And what we try to do is we try to tailor the interview to the person. So if you're a kernel programmer or you know, like a C++ programmer or a static analysis person, you'll have a <coughs> static analysis guys interview you. So we do have that sort of matching. Uh, so you won't get an interview from a, like a C++ guy when you're only doing front end. Um, the 
see. I can follow that up with a couple stories. Uh, so, so about um, oh, this is a little old story. About two years ago, um, Facebook decided that we wanted to. Uh, well, we started four years ago. Two years ago, we decided to uh, create an interpreter and run our entire site, which is running in PHP, by the way, in C++. So what we actually do currently, what we did two years ago, is we took PHP code, translated it to C++, compiled it into one giant binary, and deployed it to all of our search. And that was the web search. We got rid of Apache, we got rid of PHP. Um, this project is called Hip Hop, it's open source, <coughs> I'm to play with it. Um, and my job was to, I was an engineer back then, and my job was to take, uh, you know, the, the, all the Apache web servers and convert them to Hip Hop web servers. And normally, like, if you wanted to change a website that's PHP, and it's like, let's say, 2,000 PHP files, and only one file changed, you just copy that one file over, you restart the Apache server, and it's done. Um, but now, since you compile this, I have to take this binary and send it to all the web servers. This binary was 1.5 gigabytes. And at that point, we had 10,000 servers. Um, so my job was to get this 1.5 gigabyte binary to 10,000 servers. And that was challenge of the case. And pretty much, if I didn't do it, you know, the site wouldn't get converted to hip hop. Uh, this is when you know, we brainstormed with the help of your colleagues, with the help of like judge. In general, like you just toss questions out there, people are going to respond. Internally, we have a lot of communication going on, so you can ask a lot of questions to people. And you know, someone started suggesting ideas, and eventually we came down to implementing this using BitTorrent. Our entire deployment system. Now, the torrents itself across our data And it, you know, it was something I had to write up. So it, 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 it's a challenge, but again, you have a lot of help. You have a lot of smart people on your team. It's a lot of fun. More recently, um, one of my challenges was to take, so we have a system called Gatekeeper. What that does is it gates people in and out of features. So for example, if you, um, we don't, if you notice, we don't roll out like, things like timeline to everyone all at once. We roll it out very slowly. And the way we do this is through tooling. Like, so Gatekeeper manages the user to feature. So it knows every single user what features they have and what features are present. So you can say, hey, I have this user X. Um, I want this feature A. Uh, is, this, like, is this guy have it or not? And based on that, in your code, you make a decision to either show it or not. And this system is, like, my, my team works on this system right now, and my job was to architect it so that it can scale um, to our user base. And it does about a billion requests a second to that system. Um, so, you know, like, there's, there's, there's a lot of challenges, mainly due to our size, um, that, the, the, I think the hardest part about my job is that I can't go to a web search like Google and say, here's my problem, someone answer this for me. Uh, it just does not work. You can, get, you can get hints from your competitors, but they're not going to give it up either. Right? And it's, 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 it's just a challenging environment. It's a, it's a different sort of challenge. And this is kind of why I, I you know, I think two years ago, I got offered a, a, a co-founding position at a, a pretty popular startup now. But like they're like, hey, come, come start a company with us. And this is when I was, I was working on the Bitcoin stuff. And I, I thought about it. And you know, if I, if I went to that startup, all I would be doing is the same thing I had done at, previously at my startup, which is setting up monitoring for my servers, making sure the servers work properly, you know, configuration-wise and things like that. And all of these open source tools that you download, install, and configure, and things like that. It's, it's the same thing over and over again. It's nothing brand new. And what Facebook allows me to do is give me challenges that no one has ever faced before. And you know, like sometimes you fail, sometimes you succeed, but you succeed. It's, it's pretty cool. Hopefully that answers your question.
we, we have a lot of security guys. Um, so I can go through our teams. Um, so one type of security is physical security. So like actual physical access to our machines, our campuses, all of that stuff, lockdown, how our badge system works, how our guest system works, all of that, right? Uh, the second type of security team is our uh, product security team. So their main job is to protect our product, which is our website. To make sure that no one can hack it, no one can um, you know, do things to it. And we have teams that do both. Like physical and product security at the same time. For example, we um, we have teams that will try to hack into our system and our campuses. Uh, like one of the teams, they uh, their main job is to like break into the campus. Like their job is to install a laptop on our network and go and detect it uh, and find out how many days until someone in the security team, which they work for too, notices that someone broke in. So we have those types of teams. Um, we have a, a, like, it's called a site integrity. So they're trying to protect the integrity of the website. So like blocking spam users, blocking, uh, you know, people from getting fish. So this is a big deal. Like you, you might have gotten messages like, hey, uh, I'm your friend. I'm stuck in, you know, South Africa. I need, you know, some money wire to me. Or I'm stuck in Nigeria or whatever, right? And they'll be like, oh, can you go to the best restaurant? Wire into this location, and it's a scam. And you know, like smart people like you and me probably won't fall for it. But when you have a billion users, there's going to be someone who's dumb enough to say, "Oh, I don't know this person, but you know, yes, I'll help you." And it's it's amazing how many people fall for this. And even today, like I see, you know, posts from my friends that say, um, "Hey, Facebook doesn't care about your privacy. Can you go click this?" and uncheck these three things and it will prevent my updates from being public. Which is completely not true by the way. It does not do what it says it does. But even my own aunt, who I think is pretty smart, she, she works at Stanford in a medical lab, posted the same thing. And I had to explain to her, like, you're, you're not understanding the problem. Like, this was a joke posted by someone and you're just copying and pasting it. Uh, and, you know, like, things like that, you want to protect the users because it affects the credibility of your site. Uh, so we have a huge team that uh, does a lot of machine learning. This, at a billion users, you cannot have this manual process. You know, when people are looking at people, when people uh, try to, like, you know, you know, attack children, or who try to lure children, that's a big thing now. Um, we have a lot of machine learning algorithms that go through and try to detect this. Um, it's a very sophisticated system and it's a lot of them to work on. And fortunately, that team works out of London. So, do Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, we had three people from our last year's uh, undergrad hiring uh, end up on that team. Um, and they were, they're all three of them are very successful. So, their job is pretty much to play a cat and mouse game against bad guys. And it's, it's if, you, if you like reactive work, if you like work where you're constantly changing projects, you're constantly doing different things every day, that's the work for you. If you're a person who needs a very like consistent roadmap, like I know what I'm going to be working on for the next two months, that is probably not the job for you because they, those guys have spikes of like three days straight of working and then they'll party. Because when, when there's an attack going on, you cannot leave your computer. Like, these guys are fighting 24 hours a day. And that's why there's a team in London specifically to cover the nighttime shift during when uh, California is sleeping. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a pretty good team. It's about 40 people, I think. And there's about eight people in London working on the team. You guys have any questions for Ethan? How are the two cultures different, working in India and in outside? So, we do not have an engineering office in India. Um, we do have other departments in India, but all our engineering offices are either in the UK or in the US. So we have four engineering offices worldwide, California, Menlo Park, uh, Seattle, 
in Washington, New York City, and London. That's all. Uh, we have a few remote engineers working out of you know, their houses in the US or in Europe, but we do not have any engineers in India. So yeah, we only hire for the US or London. Yeah, I can talk about the culture between London and the US, but that's about it. I mean, it's, being, being on the main campus is really the best. Uh, we have this really, so what we did is we bought Sun Microsystems old campus and we kind of converted it into a mini town. Uh, there's uh, two cafeterias and about think, seven different food places on campus, including like a dedicated Mexican food shop, a uh, dedicated coffee shop, a Mexican restaurant, burger joint, barbecue, like everything you can think of is there. There's even like a barber shop, a bank, and I forget something, a bike shop, and all these things inside the campus. Um, and the person is amazing on the main campus. Like, it's next to nothing, nothing. Like I can't even, like I work in London, so I don't get any of those benefits. But it's, it's always fun to go back and just, just see. Like it's, it's almost like being in a, in a Disneyland or something. It's really different. Um, so the idea was that Zuckerberg really wanted engineers. This is a very engineering driven company. Engineers are like first class citizens. I mean, you can probably tell you that more than me. But um, it's so like, you know, you know Zuckerberg's an engineer himself. So the way engineering works is like, Engineers come up with the ideas. Engineers implement those ideas and they go out and do it. And Zuck's idea was to not let engineers trouble themselves outside of work. Like everything else will be taken care of for you. You just need to worry about doing your work. So all the food is free. All you know, all the restaurants. Actually, two restaurants are paid for the Japanese one and the Mexican one. But they're subsidized. But other than that, all the other restaurants are free. Um, and um, yeah. Like, I don't even pay for laundry. Like, the laundry is taken care of, dry cleaning is taken care of, uh, and you know, your transportation is taken care of, everything is taken care of. You just have to worry about good work. It's, how busy am I at work? It really depends on the day. Um, my, I can, I can tell you two things. I'll tell you my, my version of it, because I do a lot more uh, building up a site, hiring, recruiting, doing tech talks, uh, traveling a lot. Uh, but a typical engineer probably won't do as much. So I'll give you both versions. So my day usually depends. So I, being in London, I have to video conference with California a lot. So I usually tend to stay later. So I won't come in to work till about 10, 30, 11 a.m. and then I'll stay till about 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Um, but, you know, engineering has no hours, so you can really come in anytime you want, leave anytime you want. What we measure on is your impact. And what I mean by impact is, did you ship what you said you would? Did you, like, is your project having better impact than we expected it to, that you would have avoided? Um, and it's, it's not just that you finish your work, right? Like, that's not where it ends. It's how well did you, like, anticipate this project to do? How well did you plan? How well did you execute it? How well did it, it, it itself execute? A lot of it depends on your adoption of your tools. Like, I like tools, and if they're not adopted, then that means I'm not doing a good job. Me writing the tool, completely tool, is not my job. It's, my job is to make sure the tool works and it does what it says it does or even better. So a lot of my work is like figuring out how the, the tool can be better. Uh, so you're constantly thinking about it. You know, like I have the best ideas when I'm like sitting at home or in a shower or like, you know, playing video games or whatever. I like subconsciously like ideas just come to me like, oh this is a great idea, let's go try it out. So um, to me I'm always kind of working. But in terms of hours, I, I try to keep very normal hours. I, you know, if you saw my profile picture, I'm a kid. So I try to go home, have dinner, things like that. So my hours, work hours are not that long. 
Uh, but to be honest, like, it really depends on the person. I know engineers in California who stay at work mainly because they're pretty food. Because then they don't have to go make food for themselves. Uh, but we have everything you possibly need, right? Um, we have probably about a bar every 200 feet on campus. Uh, so there's plenty of alcohol, there's plenty of video games, uh, there's plenty of things to do, I think. But again, when it comes down to it, if you don't do your work, it's, it's going to be hard. Concept differs for a black from computer science, and a black from some other stream. What is the reason that it's different? Okay, how does it differ from computer science versus not? Um, so I had an intern who, his master's degree was in mathematics. Uh, can you this, can you but you this he could too. pass it for an interview. And he actually did really well uh, on his internship. And then he did really well at his job after he got it. So it really doesn't matter. It's like your passion on how much how much you code, how well can you answer the questions that I show you, for example. Uh, and like how the question you want the job, how well do you communicate to the interviewer? I would let Nathan ask answer that. We prefer computer science. Uh, I wouldn't say we prefer, but yeah. Um, like like uh, Rich mentioned, it's more about coding than anything else. So like I said, you don't need to be you know how to code, that's pretty much it. Yeah, but when we go to campus, do we allow other students on campus to sit for the test? We might not do that because it's too much for us to handle. Um, so we, we, on campus, we prefer students only from uh, IT, computer science, and EC uh, to take part in the interview. Uh, but off campus, we're okay if somebody's interested. They can always apply through referrals or through that and reaching out to the interview. And when you're applying, again, you like, your resume has to stand out, right? So work on some such projects, do things that normally people don't do, and it's going to pay off. Not just for, you know, Facebook, like industry life. I've been hiring for Yahoo, I've been hiring for other places, and it's the same thing. So open source will always help. How much do you pay matter? How much do you pay matter? I probably wouldn't be working here in the phrase matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible at school. Like, I, I did not, in my university, I did not go to most of my classes. Uh, so, it, like, it really depends on how well you're going to do, how well you're going to do. Actually, it's like while employing, while taking a campus placement, what is the criteria that is relevant, right? So, campus, campus placements, I don't know. So, I, 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 right out of college, I did not join Facebook, so I don't really have the campus experience. Um, no, they don't. They don't. We, we don't, I, I don't remember checking the grades. So it's a very simple process. We, uh, we like you mentioned, you have a, you know, a recruiter pre-screening the resume. Uh, it's more about like if some resume is standing out in terms of the other. Uh, but we don't even shortlist resumes that way. Uh, we come to the campus, we run the coding test. Anybody who clears the test to a, to a point where we want like a particular score and above goes to the next round of the and if we feel that somebody is on a borderline on that test, we still review the code so that in case if the code is good and we can take that person forward, we still do that. So we don't even look at the, you know, to be honest, we don't even look at the grade on the post -grade. It's It's open for all. Anybody who's from that uh, stream, like an IT, computer science, or EC, can come and write the test, and depending upon the score, we move forward. Do you have for the internships? Yes. Android and iOS. Oh. <coughs> Mobile question. Um, not that much. Uh, like I said earlier, like uh, if you have a specific area that you have experience in, what we'll do is we'll have interview. The interviewers will also be experienced in that area. So if you send your CV and says, "Hey, you know, I've done Android before. I've done an internship in Android," we're most likely going to have you get interviewed by an Android person. Because it just makes more sense because we can, it, it's, it's, to us, it's about how well we can gather signal that you're 
you're in a fit location or not, right? And that's what we're trying to determine. And if we can get more signal out of the interview, we will. And we'll do everything we can to do that. The initial couple of rounds are uh, generic for everybody. So we do not uh, have like a different interview question for somebody who's interested to join a mobile team for Android or iOS. Uh, initially, it's the same. Post, uh, post the first couple of rounds, which will be more quick. When you get come to an on-site stage where you interview uh, face to face, and you have that passion to join uh, a particular technology or a particular team and as such, that's when, like they said, you will have interviews coming and talking about that. That's all. But initially, the first couple of skilling levels is safe for everyone. Again, honestly, like, it doesn't really matter because we, we, we really love uh, families. And we encourage people in the company to move. So after about a year of working for Facebook, uh, or a year and a half, what we do is we have multiple programs that help engineers move around the company. Uh, one of the programs is called Hackama. So the idea is after about a year or a year and a half, you work on a completely different team. So like if you're working on mobile, then we would encourage you to go work on either front end or maybe like C++ or whatever, something that you think you'll be passionate about, and, but it's a new area for you. And then you go work on this team uh, for a month, on a month long very specific project, and then you finish that project, and then you can decide, if I'm gonna stay on that team because I like it so much, or I can come back. And we usually have about a 50% rate where the people stay on and work for that team. So we have engineers moving across the company. So I, I've moved teams, I think, uh, Four times now, out of my five and a half years. So, four different teams. And it's very common to do different things. Because again, for us, it's we, our hiring process, like, if you can meet our engineering bar, you can work with any team, really. Uh, obviously, like, we wouldn't want to work with others, it's not a good area, but you can pretty much work anywhere else. And then, uh, for us, it's more beneficial to keep people passionate about what they work on, so we work on different things. So, Thank you more passion about it. Alright guys, I'm going to be up here. If you have any more questions, come see me. Uh, or thanks for coming. Hope it was informational. And uh, hope to see you at the end of the